गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स होप यू आर वेल एंड डूइंग फाइन आई एम अशोक कानावाला एंड एक्सटेंड अ वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू टू दिस वेबिनार टुडे विद मी ऑन दिस कॉल आर रोशी जैन सीनियर फंड मैनेजर हु मैनेजेस एच डी सी टैक्स एवर ई एल एस एस बिसाइड्स अदर स्ट्रेटेजीज लाइक फ्लेक्सी कैप एंड फोकस थर्टी दैट इज नियरली ओवर सेवेंटी थाउजेंड करोर्स ऑफ यूम अंडर मैनेजमेंट एंड विथ मी इज माई कलीग अमाय दौलकर हु हेल्प मी मॉडर दिस कॉल before i invite roshi to say uh, her thoughts on the markets economy let me set the background for this call as the march comes uh, the normal tax saving related investment uh, gets a heightened activity by level 11 months people are fairly sure about their income levels and uh, of course then they would like to save some tax on it and therefore the tax savings instruments and of course therefore the need to look for tax savings options we are discussing one such option today uh, which is the uh, elss section equity linked savings schemes which has been in existence for now nearly 3 decades but before i talk about elss let me say a few words to the people who are due to this call to the news to this concept what is the section etc all about so when we talk about income tax and we want to save some tax uh, on our income uh, there are certain provisions under income tax act and one such provision is section 80c which talks about uh, investment into certain specified investments which gets deducted from your income and because of which you save tax on the amount invested such investments can be ppf can be lic can be lss can be a loan on your children's education and so on and so forth now how does this work so as i said that if you maximum amount are available under section 80c and that also is available only to individuals and hufs is up to rupees 1 lakh 50000 so suppose your income is around 12 lakh rupees crores and you invest 1 lakh 50000 in lss your net income falls to 10 lakh 50000 and because of which at the various lab rate tax you will be saving 46800 assuming you are at a 30% tax limit so this is a kind of savings you can do on the kind of investment this is what it is now what is the difference between elss ppf etc now when we look at this why elss has certain kind of advantages over other tax saving option because of the lock in period elss accounts for only Three years of lock-in and it is the least lock-in period as compared to all other options as you can see on the screen. For example, Unilever carries a five-year lock-in, PPF fifteen years, NSC five years, and so on and so forth. But there is a difference. Unilever ERSS provide return which are market linked, whereas PPF, NSC, Sukanya, tax saving they carry a specific fixed rate of interest. So then, why should I opt for ERSS? why i should not go for a fixed saving instrument which sort of you know is guaranteeing me some kind of return now when we look at all the fixed saving instruments which are guaranteeing some kind of return over the last 10 years if you see their yields have been dropping structurally they have been coming down so if you go back and say ppf couple of years ago what they used to be around 8 and a half today they are roughly around 7% and if i go back further 10 years then they used to be in double digits so structurally as interest rates are coming down in the country so are the returns on this tax saving instrument which are giving you guaranteed kind of returns as compared to that if you look at elss as a category as a category for the industry as a whole has given a average return or category return of 15.5% over a period of 3 years as compared to the nifty 500 which is a broader benchmark of around 14.4% so doing better than the benchmark doing much better than the other traditional tax savings instruments and that's where the precise question comes that what do you create wealth or how do you create wealth when you generate return which are significantly better than the inflation over a sustainable period of time the increase in return over the average inflation period actually helps you create wealth and that's what ears does about and that's why this session this webinar 
where we talk about not only tax saving, but we also talk about wealth creation in addition to tax savings. To further put forward my argument, we have given on the screen a comparison between provident fund, public provident fund, which is a, one of the most popular tax saving instrument uh, and has been in existence for decades now. And we have compared with ALSS, which has been in existence for eight years. And as you know, and as I've told you earlier, the average yield on PPF has been structurally coming down. So, for example, in March 96, when this scheme started, and if you would have invested rupees 1 lakh every year, every year in March 96, so for nearly 28 years, the amount accumulated in PPF would have been roughly close to 1 crore 8 lakhs. As I said, it's about investment in your capital plus return on your capital, which is structurally coming down. So that would have become 1 crore 8 lakhs. But if similar amount would have been invested in a tax saver, that amount would have been roughly close to 13 crore rupees. So that's the kind of difference in wealth you would create by investing in marketing instruments like ERSS. So while popular belief is that go with a, a short kind of return, but when you look at return over uh, when you compare it with the structural products like ELS, which is our, in this case, tax saver, it has given or created wealth up to uh, 13 crores rupees. But then some people will now say or put forward an argument. Now, what is the importance of uh, ELSS? Because uh, now government is promoting new tax regime in which you generally pay tax and uh, uh, there are no deductions allowed. But just to say to people, Government has made new tax regime optional. So you have old regime and you have new regime. And in certain cases, old regime is still beneficial. So put forward the argument. If your deduction amount is say up to 1 lakh rupee, if your income is up to additional, additional up to the 6 lakh rupees is 1 lakh rupee is extra. And if the deduction available to you is more than 1 lakh. For example, ATC gives you investment deduction of up to 1 lakh 50,000. So if your break even deduction is up to 1 lakh rupee, but if your allowed limit is 1 and a half lakh rupee, that means old regime is still beneficial. And in old regime, you still can, besides ATC, which is 1 and a half lakh rupee, you can claim 50,000 of NPS. You can also claim medical benefits. You can claim benefits of donations if you have done anything. There is a deduction of Section 80T for bank deposits, etc., etc., etc. There are various taxes. So if you consult your tax advisors, I think he can advise you better which regime would be more preferable to you. But here we have just given an illustration in terms of up to what deduction level, which regime would be beneficial. And even if for any other matter, if you are availing HRA or you have a housing rent, uh, you have purchased a house on a loan and you are paying some interest, uh, which gives you additional deduction up to 2 lakh rupee, then still old regime becomes more beneficial. So there are various scenarios under which for an individual, old regime is beneficial. And if you consult your tax advisor, you will get a better advice. But here, the argument is not only about old and new regime. The argument here is about the wealth creation. Now, as I said earlier, that this carries a lock-in of three years. Now, why this lock-in is very important. Normally, based on our past experience, investor behavior is like a pendulum. It moves from extreme optimism to extreme pessimism. Uh, if markets are going good, everything is good. And if markets are bad, they are not able to balance fear and greed and therefore take unpleasant decisions which may not work over a medium to long term in their favor. This three-year lock-in of actually tax saver comes to a rescue because during this period, you can't withdraw. In a sense, it instills a sense of financial discipline among the investors. That I'm coming with at least three years of investment horizon. And of course, longer you stay, the experience in, in care continues to become even better and better. For example, on your screen, you can see that 
if you would have held investment in ELSS for say five years, 75% of the time, your return has been more than 10%. And if I extend my horizon to 10 years, the return in excess of 10% moves to over 90%. Now, as I know, and as I've told you, all other traditional savings instruments like PPF or NSC or Sukanya, where interest rates structurally have been coming down. And here is a product which actually you can see uh, and uh, actually see for yourself over the last 28 years how the track record has been developed. And if you continue to hold for a longer and longer period of time, the probability of getting better returns also continues to improve. And that's what this scheme over nearly now this 31st March, it will complete uh, 28 years. And if you can see for yourself that if you would have invested 1 lakh rupee at the time of inception, right, just in order to save tax or in order to uh, just as an investment product, this would have been worth rupees 2 lakh 82 crore, 2.82 crores. And if you would have, if you would have sort of continued with an SIP of roughly 10,000 a month, over the last 28 years, that would have been roughly close to over 14 crores of rupees. And that's what we give our mantra, that sound investment plus time plus patience equal to wealth creation. So this is the only product in the mutual fund space which not only helps you save tax also, but helps you create wealth. Most of the other products that you have been investing either to help you create wealth over a time. Very few people products actually meet dual objective. And this dual objective is saving tax also, as well as creating wealth over long term. So even if you do not intend to consider this from a tax saving purpose, looking at its past track record, there is a merit in considering this product purely from investment point of view. And more importantly, as I said, that this investment, when you see over a longer period of time, actually helps create wealth. This three-year lock-in actually brings a sense of financial discipline and the results or outcome are more likely to be investors' favor than otherwise. Of course, these are statutory disclosures. But now before I invite again Roshi, something about Roshi. Uh, and why this call also is warranted also, because there will be some questions in people's mind because this is a market link product. Uh, we are very, we are close to all time now, right? The market today are uh, 72,000, which is nearly peak, 73,000. Uh, and there will be question in people's mind, what next? And after that also, when we see that market for last, Great consecutive eight calendar years have given positive returns, including the COVID year. So even in the COVID year, the market gave a positive return on a calendar basis. Out of last 10 years, nine years have been up for positive returns. So logical question is that when we are very close to all-time peak, uh, and there can be some question in investors' mind that, yeah, what can we expect going forward from the market, and particularly this kind of strategy, which is market. So about Roshi, as I said, uh, Roshi has been managing fund for last over now two years. It was, uh, she has been with us for nearly more than two years and has been managing other strategies like Flexi Cap and Focus 30. Uh, Roshi, by qualification, is a chartered accountant. I am Ahmedabad graduate and CFA, uh, and has started a career with Goldman Sachs in her, in their overseas offices. Then they, she moved to. Franklin Templeton, where she was a part of research and then the fund management team. And with us, she has been part of senior fund management team. Uh, and therefore, overall experience of Roshi has been uh, of more than two decades. Uh, so without much ado, now I will invite Roshi to share her thoughts uh, on this product, on the market, on the economy, what investors, particularly when they will be coming or investing with at least three-year lock-in period, what they can expect from this kind of products going forward. So without much ado, over to you, Rosh. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you all for uh, participating in this webinar. Uh, good to connect with all of you. Um, so as uh, Ashok rightly pointed out, the 
tax saver, the ELSS tax saver product is a market linked product. And therefore, I think it's imperative that we get a sense of a broad macroeconomic framework as well as um, factors that will uh, support the markets uh, going ahead. So we have a short presentation uh, which outlines both the positives as well as the risks that we need to be aware of. Uh, and we will go into uh, each of them in a little bit of detail. But broadly, the discussion points that I would like to cover over the next um, 20 odd minutes is uh, the boxes in blue that you can see are sort of uh, medium to long term tailwinds for the economy. Uh, we are seeing a resurgence in manufacturing. Uh, our our services-driven exports model has held us in good stead, and we think that it will continue to remain a strong pillar of growth for the economy. Formalization of the economy, which uh, has been uh, on a steady uh, uptick, and we think will continue so. Uh, the banking system is extremely robust, and uh, that provides uh, good support for uh, pick up in private uh, private capex uh, that we envisage uh, should should happen uh, over the next few years. Public infra has anyway seen a uh, good up move. Um, on a relative basis, of course, India scores well from a macroeconomic perspective versus uh, peers. Um, some of the risks that we need to be cognizant of are uh, the twin deficits that we run uh, globally you know, geopolitical uncertainty as well as um, uh, interest rates that may be higher than what we saw in the last decade. Uh, and from a uh, from a India-specific perspective, valuations as well. So uh, we will delve into all of those uh, in the in the next few um, in the next few slides. The first is, of course, the uh, shift in uh, manufacturing intensity that we envisage will happen over the next few years. As you can see in the chart on the left, India manufacturing intensity has stayed stagnant in the last two decades. Um, and in 2014, the government initiated the Make in India initiative uh, in order to enhance um, the manufacturing intensity of the economy. Um, what has helped uh, in addition to the government thrust has been uh, geopolitics, where we are seeing uh, companies looking to diversify supply chains and India being a beneficiary of that, and also the cost advantage from lower wages. As you can see on the right, a huge gap has opened up between the wage costs in India and that of uh, China, and that gives uh, room for India to uh, improve its share in manufacturing um, intensity uh, and manufacturing market share. We are already, uh, the government has also created incentives for manufacturing via several schemes. Uh, one of the, one among the, the prominent one being the production linked incentive or the PLI scheme. We have seen uh, the PLI scheme uh, create very good success, especially in a sector like electronics, where the import intensity uh, uh, is for, for, for the country on the higher side. And um, as you can see in the chart on the right, we have seen a uh, good payback from that scheme of the government. And we've seen a uh, strong um, manufacturing growth in the electronics uh, segment. Uh, this scheme is now rolled out in a number of sectors. And um, the, the idea is to include uh, very many new sunrise sectors as well in its scheme, in this scheme. and. Uh, our expectation is that uh, we will start to see the impact of this scheme in uh, many of the other sectors in addition to electronics, such as telecom, networking products, pharma, food processing, um, the electric vehicle space, advanced cell chemistries, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, we believe that India is now uh, set to witness higher manufacturing intensity over the next few years, and that will be a significant contributor to GDP growth. Um, the unique services-driven exports model is something that uh, has held the country in very good stead over the last two decades. Um, Indian services exports have seen robust growth driven uh, not just by the cost advantage, but also by talent availability. Uh, the IT services segment is something, of course, uh, that we have seen uh, India 
build a, cons uh, a considerable success story. Uh, but we are also now starting to see the non-IT services also contribute to uh, service exports. Uh, we are seeing global captive centers setting up a shop in India, not just for IT services, but also for other uh, service segments. The availability of talent being one of the key drivers of, uh, of this um, move. Uh, and we are uh, now seeing that uh, India's share in services exports has been on an uptrend, uh, contrary to the um, manufacturing story. But we, we think that both the manufacturing and services uh, market share will perhaps continue to trend up. Uh, on, the banking, on the banking system, I think one of the key ingredients for uh, sustainable growth in an economy is a robust banking system. Uh, and the India banking system is fairly robust. Uh, as you can see in the charts below, uh, whether it is um, the NPA cycle, the non-performing asset cycle, whether it's, on, uh, whether it's the capital availability with banks, we are seeing that banks are in good stead on both counts. Uh, and we believe that... Um, uh, you know, the, the banking system is very well placed in order to support the funding requirements of the economy. Infrastructure has been a very big thrust of uh, the government uh, over the last uh, several years. Uh, it's, as you can see in the chart on the left, uh, the uh, the these the government thrust on capex has uh, we, we've seen a large thrust by the government on uh, capex um, and infrastructure projects uh, we've almost seen a two and a half times increase in the allocation uh, by the government towards infrastructure uh, whether it is roads railways <clears throat> uh, urban uh, urban uh, uh, urban development projects, waterways, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as uh, we are all well aware, infrastructure spending has a multiplier effect on the economy and it plays a key role uh, in improving productivity of the economy as well as in attracting um, foreign investments into the country. One area where uh, we are yet to see significant and decisive pickup has been private capex. Over the last few years, uh, private capex has lagged public capex and the government has been doing most of the heavy lifting in terms of um, uh, expenditure on capex. But as things stand today, we think that the environment is conducive for private capex to pick up. Uh, we are seeing corporate leverage, which is at uh, decadal lows. Um, we are... Uh, you know, as highlighted in the past, the manufacturing uh, intensity of the economy is likely to pick up and that will require capex outlay by companies. Um, and, uh, you know, there is rising interest of uh, global corporations as well to set up manufacturing in India in order to diversify their supply chains. Uh, additionally, government uh, policies are also supportive. Uh, I think a combination of all of this will uh, will result in a pickup in private capex, uh, which is one of the uh, key pillars of GDP growth. And we do expect that um, over the next few years, given the uh, given that the conditions are quite conducive, we will start to see a pickup in private capex as well. The other element of capex that uh, is also a significant contributor is um, just household capex, uh, and a large part of household capex is uh, the housing uh, related or, or real estate sector. Um, the previous decade was a, was a decade where uh, we did not we saw a muted housing cycle. Uh, but we've now seen pick up in that uh, and real estate sector picking up, uh, driven by affordability, as you can see in the chart, the home loan to income ratio, home loan payment to uh, income ratio is now uh, attractive and uh, provides uh, the affordability for households to uh, invest uh, in real estate. Uh, we are also seeing um, that after a slew of uh, regulatory interventions in the real estate sector, consumer demand, consumer momentum and um, consumer confidence in the sector is back. And that's the reason we are starting to see volumes pick up as well. Um, we are uh, inventory levels continue to stay healthy and we do think that the housing cycle is on the path of recovery. A combination of a, a pickup in private sector as well as the uh, household capex, uh, in addition to the government focus on public capex and infrastructure, we think uh, is one of the key uh, 
uh, elements of the growth cycle uh, for the next few years. If we just compare uh, India versus the other economies, on the growth side, as you can see, uh, India does <clears throat> India does ha uh, does uh, uh, India is growing faster than uh, not just the developed market economies, but also its emerging market peers. Um, and this growth is happening without uh, necessarily adding to uh, leverage. Uh, and if you look at the chart on the right, you will see that um, over the last decade. Uh, we have consolidated our debt to gdp ratio uh, whereas uh, most uh, uh, most advanced economies as well as china have seen a significant pickup uh, in leverage and i think that the fact that we have grown without compromising on aggregate balance sheet is an extremely attractive and uh, is an extremely attractive proposition for most global investors and macroeconomically um, positions us well uh, for uh, growth in the next uh, decade uh, just a quick uh, snapshot of flows. Uh, we are seeing both foreign flows, uh, you know, uh, in addition to, of course, the very strong domestic flows that uh, we're all well aware of. Um, but um, just to keep in perspective that uh, only 5% of Indian household assets are in equities, and that number is much higher uh, in some of the uh, advanced economies. Um, so we are still as a country underpenetrated in terms of financial assets and equities. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that leaves enough headroom uh, in the longer term for participation by households uh, in the equity story. Let's now look at some of the challenges uh, and headwinds that we should be aware of. Um, the first is uh, India's twin deficits. Uh, we, the from a from a um, uh, from a uh, flows perspective um, i think the capital account remains susceptible to uh, just tightening across advanced economies um, i think that globally we are you know we are now quite interlinked um, and what happens in uh, one part of the world does does have ripple effects on uh, the other parts of uh, the world as well so um, this is something that we just need to be aware of as we are seeing, um, you know, either a slowdown or quantitative tightening across major advanced economies. Uh, this is a risk to just keep at the back of our minds, um, resulting in potential currency volatility as well. Uh, on the current account side, of course, uh, one of the larger items of imports is uh, crude and therefore any hardening of energy prices could have an impact on current account. Uh, on the fiscal deficit side, I think the government has embarked on a path of fiscal consolidation and uh, they have outlined a 4.5% target by FY26. Uh, as you can see, um, you know, uh, and as demonstrated in the last budget as well, I think the government is intent on walking the path towards fiscal consolidation. So um, in, I, I think the... Uh, you know, given that backdrop, I think we just need to keep in mind that uh, the government has already done its fair share in terms of uh, infrastructure investments and public spending. Uh, and I think uh, that, you know, um, in the event of a slowdown, I think the ability of the government to uh, step in, um, given the backdrop that they are looking at fiscal consolidation is is is, is limited or could be limited. Uh, in terms of um, <clears throat> the inflationary scenario, I think this decade perhaps uh, has certain factors that could contribute to higher inflation uh, globally. Um, largely, you know, we have in the past decade, there has been um, ESG concerns and capital dis and, uh, you know, the, uh, the intent to stay disciplined on capital allocation and this weighed in on CapEx in several sectors such as oil and gas and therefore um, the lack of adequate supply response could, could be a challenge uh, in some of these sectors and therefore the inflationary impulse. In addition, uh, demographic changes uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as the um, move towards decarbonization, as well as geopolitics-driven realignment of supply chains could lead to higher inflation this decade versus uh, the kind of uh, scenario that we saw in the previous decade. Uh, food inflation is also something that, um, you know, could raise its head uh, periodically given uh, 
climate change as well as geopolitical tensions. <clears throat> this therefore uh, brings us to a scenario where we should be prepared for a higher for longer kind of interest rate environment, at least uh, uh, as a base case, we should not assume that we would get back to uh, the extremely low levels of interest rate that existed in the last decade um, because uh, government deficits across the world uh, are still elevated. Uh, central bank balance sheets are still significantly larger than pre-COVID levels. Uh, we've talked about some of the inflationary impulses, um, tight labor market. And therefore, I think <clears throat> as a base case, uh, it's fair to uh, contend with an environment where there is higher cost of capital and interest rates which could stay elevated uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, in addition, uh, we could also be facing an environment of slowing global growth. Uh, some of the large economies, uh, China in particular, has seen a slowdown in significant slowdown in real estate uh, and uh, that could have uh, wider ramifications. Um, as you can see, uh, I think <clears throat> uh, post the COVID pent up uh, demand, uh, we are starting to see some softening in global growth. And all of this is happening in an environment where leverage levels are particularly high. Um, so economic weakness in an over leveraged global economy is something that we need to uh, is something that we need to monitor. Finally, on valuations. Um, post the significant up move in markets, um, valuations are now trading uh, much above average. Um, what we have shown here is the uh, Nifty valuations uh, versus uh, the 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 ten year average, and you can see that we are trading at a premium, uh, even relative to uh, the emerging market uh, peers. Um, we are trading at a premium. If you look at the mid cap and the small cap valuations, uh, the premium is uh, heightened as compared to the premium that we saw in the large cap headline index. Um, and uh, while of course, um, you know, this is an aggregate level and uh, we do look at stock specific valuations while constructing our portfolio. Nevertheless, on an aggregate basis, you can see that um, valuations both for the mid cap segment and the small cap segment are uh, significantly above uh, even their uh, even one standard deviation above average. So in some uh, in summary, I think that um, on a relative basis, there is no doubt that uh, you know India does look like a safe haven, especially seeing the levels of indebtedness as well as the slowing growth globally, and many of the catalysts for the economy are. Uh, quite uh, long lasting uh, and they are structural. Um, we are likely to see a pickup in manufacturing intensity, something that uh, we did not see in the last decade. Um, we are likely to see a pickup in private sector capex uh, with a continued government thrust on infrastructure, all of which bodes well for increase in GDP. Um, however, uh, we should just be aware of the fact that globally things are a bit soft um, and um, Higher than average valuation multiples in our market entails a more disciplined and a long term approach to investing. Uh, so as I would as I'd like as as the headline states, I think this is the time to be disciplined and not tactical while making investments in the market. Uh, with that uh, broad backdrop about the economy as well as markets, uh, let's move to the HDFC ELSS tax saver product. Uh, now, this is a product which um it's a it's a, a 13000 crore aum product um it's predominantly invested in large caps at this point in time i showed you at an aggregate level the valuations of the different segments large mid and small and uh, basis that as well um i think the risk reward on the large caps uh, is definitely at this point more attractive versus the mid and small cap segment. Uh, so you will see a larger allocation towards the large cap space. Uh, our endeavor is to keep the ELSS tax saver an extremely diversified product. And therefore, if you look at the top 10 holdings, you will find a good mix of banks, manufacturing, utilities, um, export oriented IT services, healthcare, and so on. Um, the idea is to 
uh, is to invest in stocks which have uh, medium to long term growth characteristics and where valuations are uh, still reasonable from a medium term perspective. Uh, if you look at the sectoral positioning of the tax saver product, uh, financials and healthcare are the two extremely large uh, overweights in the portfolio. As far as financials are concerned, um, we think that the drivers in the medium term uh, are credit growth, a benign credit cycle and the opportunity for greater financialization of savings. On, on the healthcare side, um, we think that the key drivers are uh, a stable domestic market opportunities in the US, uh, as well as relatively reasonable valuations. Um, the other overweights in the uh, in the uh, in the fund are the communication services telecom sector, where we are seeing some revival in pricing power, uh, as well as the real estate sector, where we think that um, uh, you know the sector is going through an upcycle and uh, is a much more consolidated sector than it was. Uh, uh, in in the previous decade, uh, in terms of underweights, most of our underweights are either in global facing sectors uh, such as materials and energy, where we think that uh, globally things could uh, look uh, a bit soft, uh, especially given the 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 real estate issue in China, uh, and also the consumer staple sector, where we think that in co in the context of slowing growth, um, the valuations are excessive. Uh, so this is the current positioning of the ELSS tax saver. I think uh, we 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 have ensured that we are able to participate in the medium to long term opportunities um, in various sectors. At the same time, uh, stay disciplined to our philosophy of growth at reasonable price. Uh, so with that, I will uh, I will stop. So this is the month of March, and of course, as I said, that all people will be calculating their income and tax liabilities and the ways to save taxes. ELSS, Exit Tax Saver ELSS is one such option with a track record of nearly 20 years. You can rely on this product uh, and park your money with the idea of tax saving or even for wealth creation from a medium to long term perspective and uh, continue to support us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rashi. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.